if any if anybody calls, just can't, just hang up. Just hit the end button if anybody calls, because mm -hmm. it'll mess the periscope up. So mainly to stay on me, but you also get the room as well. Okay, so, so everyone is can it see. Recording now it's recording now. It's recording now. We're live. Yeah, oh, okay. we're live on periscope. So you can do whatever angle, lighting, whatever. I trust you just to make sure. Well, why would you want me to stand right here? Right, right on you. Well, you can stand there, oh, or wherever. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to, but I want it sound wise as part of it. I want okay. to make sure you're fine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so first and foremost, I just want to thank you all for gathering here for such an impromptu meeting. Um, I stepped down here to support James Osiris over in uh, West Point for a community, West, 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 Westport. Westport, for Westport, excuse me, um, for a community meeting there um, because I've been canvassing. For those who don't know, I've been canvassing Baltimore for the last several weeks, ever since the revolt, uh, in attempts or in progress to a solution, which, by the way, we've coined the New Black Wall Street, right? Um, which we hear that term thrown around a lot. We know that Black Wall Street itself, or Greenwood, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, was the most successful, or most no noted black community, successful black community in America, where there were 600 businesses, hospitals, churches, bus lines, all black owned, airplanes all black owned, post office all black owned, like an actual community in which we controlled the assets, controlled our dollars, it's the, our dollars stayed within our community 12 to 18 times circulating before we leave the community. Whereas today a black dollar leaves our hands in six minutes, mm -hmm. as opposed to other communities which are eight, 16, 12 times themselves yeah. and keep a money turnover, right? But, so, as I, have been, I'll tell you the whole vision in a second, but as I see Black Wall Street get thrown around so much, what's different about our model, when we say new Black Wall Street, what's different about our model is that I understand economics, I understand real estate. Um, one thing that people don't speak about enough is a social component of Black Wall Street. If you had a community in 19, 1920s, right, that you're talking about is just 60 years removed, 50 years removed from actual enslavement, what was going on in their psyche, in their mind, in their spirit that allowed them to be so self-sustaining and so successful? And it was a social component. Why the black community, New African community, is not as successful as we would like today in all these inner cities that we see in Baltimore, Detroit, North Addison, Camden, Atlanta, Houston, any Chicago, Watts, Oakland, name it, anywhere, is uh, not just the economic side, economic simulation, but it's the social component, the fact that how we're broken and we suffer from so much trauma socially. So a big component to our success as New Black Wall Street is to be able to offer the social support for our community to help us prepare and heal our trauma as we also look to attack this, uh, the economics of our community and help us prepare financially, economically. And we're not gonna leave out also our political power. Those are the three things that Marcus Garvey laid out for us and Malcolm X laid out for us that still are relevant today of where we suffer. And that's political oppression, social, uh, economic exploitation, and social degradation, being degraded socially, and our, tra our trauma socially. So our motto under Black Wall Street, and all we're doing here in Baltimore, people say, why you choose Baltimore? I didn't choose Baltimore, I chose all of Black America, all, of, all, all of New Africans, but it has to start somewhere. And Baltimore being some places that I have roots uh, I sold drugs here back in the 90s and early 2000s. And it's the area that I helped destroy. Why not help build it up? Baltimore is also an area that is relevant in the news today. And it has eyes on it. Why not take advantage of that media and that press and do the follow-up work to all the cameras, the 300 stations that were down City Hall during the revolt, or none exist today, and all the leaders that were on down City Hall and marching that very few are still on the ground coming with solutions. Let's take advantage of all that momentum and actually do something, right? So that was my commitment from the moment I did the uh, BET panel where they had all the Bloods and Crips and they were in a solutions panel with Mark Lamont Hill and all his, uh, Brother Jeff and all these leaders talking about solutions for Baltimore and nothing got done in that hour and a half segment. And so afterwards, I looked a couple of the gang members eye to eye and said, they said they want to do something. They said. What the, what the community has been saying, right, those most in poverty in our community, the least among us, have been saying, if there's all these nonprofits, if you guys doing all this work, where are y'all? We out here on the block all day, where are y'all? So yeah, you have your, your, your network and your group and your whatever, 
but you're not affecting those that are least among us, that are going through it the most. And so we have to be very assertive and strategic about doing it. Yes, we have to empower ourselves as the educated or the elite or the talented tenth or the middle class growing to the upper class, but what about our brothers and sisters who haven't had the education that we've had? Or made some mistakes in life, or just grew up in a worse situation than we grew up, or just suffer from a different trauma than we suffer. So we have to repair ourselves holistically and comprehensively and cohesively. And so that's why our black is all black, black, our new Black Wall Street motto is, and I don't really care what the hell we name it, Black Wall Street is a name that we recognize for success within our community, which is why we adopted it, like many people adopted it. But we say the new Black Wall Street because our philosophy is new and our groundwork is real. Like we're not just doing this for the branding of it. This is like actually, how do we get it done? And so the way we get it done, it has to be a component of unity. And part, part of what Baltimore as well is because the people, as you see, and this is a small group. This is over one Instagram post and an email blast. This is, it's not about number. You're like, oh, you have 300. It's not about 300 people. I'll take three people with a pure heart ready to die for their community before I take 300 that's half stepping. It's about those who really are committed, who really want to get it done. This is a small group. Um, I want to break out after this. I'm just kind of, some people are new, just to give them an overview of what it is. And then we, our next steps are building our council. It's building a council of 18 people, nine in Baltimore and nine nationally, that will help build out the Black Wall Street model and our Black Tea Party, our political model. Right. So we need political power. So we're going to give ourselves political power through a political organization. And through economic and social, we're going to do that under the Black Wall Street District, or the new Black Wall Street District, whatever you want to call it. So anyway, our whole thing is, once we identify our core leaders, which everyone's not in this room today, there'll be another more um, plan, better plan meeting for next week, as we had a very successful meeting last week with 50 people coming in, the week before with 35. And it's not about getting the numbers, it's about pulling out the pure and the honest and the authentic and the talented that can lead and the leaders. And then also identifying the support for the leaders. Not all about leadership. If leaders don't have anybody to support or anybody that will follow or anybody that will help sustain and build it out, then who are you leading? So we want to pull out, so we know that in our model, we need economics. We know that we need real estate development. We know that we need entrepreneurship training. We know that we need etiquette training. We know that we need a ton of host of social programs, economic programs, as well as real estate development. See, that's nothing with our model. I was watching. Dr. Claude Anderson's video yesterday, who teaches poweronomics. He is very popular in economics within our community, knows way more than I know, to be honest with you, and I commend him for all his work. There was one thing that I saw that we differ a little bit into how we approach our community assimilation that I hear most that, that, that Dr. Claude Anderson offer and most people offer, is that I believe that economic stimulation starts with the real estate. Everyone, the first thing they say is businesses. You gotta own our own businesses, you know, our own business. Yes, we do. The easiest business for you to own is your own home. That's the easiest business for everyone to own. That's an asset, it appreciates, there's principal pay down, there's cash flow, if you have a multi-unit, and there's tax advantages to it. It's the easiest business model to get you acclimated with even an understanding of business, owning an asset, building your credit, budgeting, the responsibility. How are you going to have a responsibility of having 10 employees, but you can't have one tenant? So I believe real estate is a pilot for our community to be able to educate themselves, empower themselves, and get that feeling of ownership and start getting on our toes in regards to owning. Not to mention that you can't control what you don't own. We can't control our communities if we don't own our communities. If we educate 100 homeowners in the community about how they can use their job that may be a medium household income of 25,000, but if you bought a two family, now your income's 32,000 because you're getting rental credit for the other unit. Or let our community know you can use your section eight money or section eight vouchers to buy a property. Section eight doesn't mean rent. You also can own a home. Or let our community understand that we can, three of us can be a co-borrower on one loan and put my 25,000 a year or your $25,000 a year or your $25,000 a year and we might be cramped for two years, but we'll own and control and can build wealth, right? So those are the kind of disciplines we're gonna to bring to the community, along with, for those who have already evolved past home ownership, so to speak, we'll have economic programs as well. And then our model is to really create easy access 
to every kind of social program that we need to prepare ourselves, right? So that's how we're gonna really break out. We're gonna break out in political, economic, and social groups, as well as self-defense for our community, which is gonna be big for policing our own areas and protecting our own areas. And then we'll have communications and marketing and PR and every, we have it all itemized. So listen, that's what that guy is there for. That's why I waited for him. He's the micro to my macro. I think big, I think micro, I'm a visionary. That's what I do. And that's one of the key things for all our business owners, why most of our businesses fail. See, when you're a CEO of a business, you're the visionary for the business. But if you're a CEO caught looking down, managing your employees or managing your followers or managing your business, you no longer be the visionary looking forward because you're caught managing, looking down. It's called the black hole. That's why most business owners never get out of their business. The reason why I'm able to fly around the country and do these kind of things is because I set business models up for my businesses where they run themselves. And I have chief operating officers and interim CEOs and VPs of operations and everything else that run my businesses through my vision. And I can look up and see, wait, what's going on with my community? Why are we in the red? Why are we so poor? Why are we so traumatized? Why have we got no repair? Why have we got no liberty? So um, all we're doing next, I'm just giving you, again, a, a quick briefing on what the model looks like, what our intentions are. Um, we have the model written out. We have core values that anyone involved needs to adopt um, that we'll have written out as well. We'll be recruiting. Everyone has to, it's not a Jay Morrison thing. It's not a YMC thing. It's not a, this is the opportunity for us to put it, put aside. And this, this, this is one of my, our, our, our key talking points. This is the, the, the key, this is the heartbeat, the pulse of how we win is that if we as a community put aside everything that divides us, all our organizations, yes, we all spend time to build our boards and our 501c3s and our brands, I get it, I've done so too. But if we put all those aside, put aside our sexual orientation, put aside our education level, put aside our religions, and focus on three things within our community. Liberty, which we don't have as a people. We've never received liberty. It's not in our constitution that the Africans and the enslaved Africans or descendants or heirs were liberated. They were emancipated. Emancipated means the American government said, take the chains off those people. They never said, liberate those people, free those people, and allow them to become citizens as their own nation of people in America. Or go abroad or be dual citizens or resident aliens, whatever they want to do, but let them have the free choice to do what they want to do. That's liberation. We never receive liberty, it's fact. If we stick to that one fact, we win that conversation. We don't gotta get into who did it, who's the first indigenous people on earth, and we don't gotta get into all of that. Win the conversation, win the debate, get what you came for. That's a part of our issue. We got pain, we got trauma, we have points to prove. Screw all that. Focus on liberty, justice, and repair. Part of justice is, we know that under our enslavement, it's documented. Under Jim Crow, it's documented. We all seen the Selma movie. In current day, it's documented. We've seen Freddie Gray, we've seen Oscar Grant, we've seen Kendrick Johnson, we've seen Eric Garner, we've seen Mike Brown, and on and on and on, Tamir Rice, and on and on and on. We've seen the mass incarceration, we see the government redlining, the, 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 the projects being funded. We see, we, we see the oppression, right? We see the injustice. So the injustice of our people is documented. It's not an opinion. It's not my opinion. It's documented that there's injustice. The super duper fact that is documented is that we've never been repaired for our mistreatment under enslavement, Jim Crow, or current day. Reparations. There never was any, we don't got, you know what? I don't even use the word reparation. You know why? It's such an ugly, muddy, overused word, right? So what we use is repair. The root of repair. Right, the root of repair. There's never been any repair aid or restitution for our mistreatment and the trauma caused by our mistreatment. How can I prove there's trauma? Because we lead in poverty. We lead in imprisonment. We lead in prison recidivism. We lead in high school dropouts. We lead in single parent homes. We lead in mental health issues. We are the poor, we are the worst or least in, in family wealth. We're the least in education. Where did all this come from? How did we get in this condition? Are we just that poor and that stupid? Or was it because it's a direct correlation or vestige of our mistreatment and the trauma culture of mistreatment? 
and a lack of repair. 